Let's all stand and let's get into the word of the Lord. So happy that you all are here. Can we shout out whoever is watching online and bless God for them and woohoo. So glad you are here. And um, just as Jacoby shared, it's also it's good to see Tiffany here with us again. And um, so grateful. Uh, we are, this is the last Sunday for our series called uh, TikTok. And um, y'all love saying all about it, about something about a series ending. But y'all be like, man, I'm so thankful this is over with. Jesus. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, been, it's been really fun. I hope you have learned a lot about waiting and the necessity of that, all right? All right, let's stand. We're going to a very familiar passage of Scripture, one verse. This one verse should also help solidify, um, I feel like, and this sermon, I think, should help solidify and confirm uh, what took place in worship, okay? Psalm 27, the 27th division of Psalm. One verse, verse one. Hmm. Ready? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Hmm. Of whom shall I be afraid? I don't have a list of, but when my enemies and my foes came to eat of my flesh, they stumbled and they fell. The host shall encamp all around me. I will not be afraid. And what I really want to hang my head on is really at the end. One thing have I desired, and that will I seek after, is to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But I want to preach from the Lord is my life. You may be seated. Father, without you, I'm nothing. We are everything. But together, we are everything. And I bless you for this moment in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord is my light. This, this whole series, we have learned a lot about waiting and the, the point of it all. And why you should wait. It is important to wait, which you have learned. Hopefully. But I am also convinced that even though we have been talking about waiting for a period of time, I feel like there are still some of you all dealing with the difficulty and the challenge of not seeing the promise. And the desire to see the promise and not really sure how it's going to manifest. And when something gets bad, we typically oftentimes get amnesia when it comes to the things of God. When Jacoby was talking about being consistent, it's so important to remain consistent because you never know when you're going to need the history you have with God. And consistency keeps you in the cycle of understanding the history with God. Um, sometimes it will feel as if the Father is disappointing you when he really is setting you up for something profound bad in your life should not also create it should not create a barrier but sadly bad has a habit and a way of creating a barrier called disappointment you feel betrayed let down but we should also be the people that reminds bad uh, that the promise in my life is still very much so active in heaven you have a book over your life the bible says that to everyone there's a book over our lives and that it has a promise in it, that has a future in it. But there is an attempt against the focus and the confidence of your future. And the sad thing is, a lot of us have not made peace with the future that God has selected for us because we don't like the present that is leading us to the future. If you have not found confidence in your present, you are not finding confidence in your future. And the reason why I say that is because if you can't align with the path that God has for you now, what makes you think you're going to walk in the pearly gates called promise? So God has already made this book of promises, things over our lives, but he, the devil wants you to feel that you are so far away to the point where you live distracted, think distracted, worship distracted, pray distracted, fast distracted, lift your hands distracted. And no matter what, the devil loves to uh, throw at you things called flesh nows. 
things that appeal to your flesh right now. Things that make you feel good right now. And these things are simply sent to catch your attention and to take your affection off of the Father. Your future is a past thing to God. He already knows it. And although you may not know the fullness of your future, it does not mean that you can treat your present any kind of way. He already knows the beginning and the end. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And just because you have not seen something does not mean it doesn't exist. You can get a phone call, an email right now, and it will tell you that a check is on the way to you. You're going to believe whoever told you that check is on the way. And although you don't see it, one thing you're going to do is keep on going to the mailbox the next day. The next day. And then, and then it's crazy when that thing happens that the mailman is extra late on the route that particular day. You just went waiting for something. They always come at 11.37 a.m. every time. But now today, this time I'm waiting, you want to come at 4.32? <laughs> what you been doing? Eating a, a turkey sandwich? Like, what, what's, what's the problem here, bro? But you're going to keep on going back because why? You heard of something that was on the way to you. And the concern is we're not keeping the promises in our ears because everybody else is in them. And the, the concern for me is when everybody else gets in your ear, it lures you away from going to the mailbox expecting what God said is going to come. Could you be consistent and go to the mailbox for 14 years every single day with great expectation opening their mailbox and nothing is there? Could you walk away still anticipating the next day? Or would you be frustrated because nothing is there? I get so irritated because the, the main thing I get in my mailbox now is ads. I don't know why they still keep killing trees, sending me a, a, a coupon, something I'm never going to go to in my life. But they, yet they still do. Um, but the concern for me is a lot of us are getting a lot of ads. Ooh, this looks nice. 5% off? only requires a little of my attention, only pulls me away just a little bit, you know. These are things that is coming to you, and you cannot get distracted with that. You cannot get distracted because eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of man what God has prepared for you. And if he's already prepared it, what makes you think it's never going to come your way? Ready? Let's keep going. Revelation is very important. I'm going to get to, to, to Psalm 27 in a second. Revelation, someone scream the word revelation. revelation. Sometimes the issue is we don't have enough revelation. <laughs> what do I mean by revelation? Information. We don't have insight and wisdom. And the only way that revelation manifests is through revelation. <laughs> information comes by information. Let me ask you, let me also say, tell you this. If you find yourself or anyone else around you that is insecure about their future, more than likely they don't have enough revelation about where they're going. Because there's no way you can be insecure about where God is sending you and you have the information that you need. My concern is there's a revelation deficiency going on in the body of Christ. We don't have enough information. That's how you get into the, the normalcy of church, the, the show, the facade. The, we come in here, we, we sing a song. Some of y'all probably got a little, a little like, well, he skipped over the announcements. There was no announcements to even go over because I took it out. <laughs> but we get so caught into it. We always have prayers. If someone's going to pray. They're going to pray in tongues. They're going to come up and they're going to sing a song. We may get to the songs. We don't get to the songs. Then we're going to have exhortation. Then we're going to have an announcement. Someone's going to preach. And then we're going to have altar call. Someone's going to prophesy. Someone's going to have to go to the livers. And then we're going to go home. Then we get into the routine of things that we end up missing God when he steps out of the routine. And we always think God is in the routine. When he's not in the routine, he's in the revelation. So that means that your future is in the hands, listen to me, of what you don't know. That's where your future is. It's not in the hands of everybody who knows because we don't know. Paul said we prophesy in part because we know in part. We don't know everything. Your future is only going to manifest by what you do know. And so God wants you to live informed. But the devil wants you to live ignorant. 
Paul said, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, concerning spiritual gifts, he said, brethren, I wish that you were all not ignorant concerning the gifts I've given you, which means there is a dangerous thing to live ignorant, to pursue destiny ignorantly, to do ministry ignorantly, to do business in ignorance, and people do it every day. Do you see the danger in the things that you don't know? Why? Because the importance is a lot of what we have been calling faith actually is ignorance. Oh, yeah, I'm just living by faith. I'm walking by faith. I'm just living by faith. I'm walking by faith. But why are you walking and not knowing what you're doing? Where's the faith sending you? What's the faith telling you to do? But we walk around and don't know, and that is the concern. Am I saying you need to know everything? Absolutely not. What I am saying, though, faith is not blind. Faith knows exactly where what it's doing, exactly where it's sending you. And you may not have all the details, but you should have something. Even if it's just instruction, that's the only thing I need because I know, where, I know that God has me. Faith is very aware. Whether you want to believe it or not, faith is very aware. It is understanding. It knows exactly. And sometimes what people call blind faith actually is just a lack of details. You don't know. That's why you, you can say it out of your mouth, but is your heart settled on it? And if your heart is not settled on it, maybe, maybe you need to go back and talk to God one more time. Why? Because God is a very detailed God. Why would he number the hairs on your head and not give you any details? Because when you go to that hairdresser and they got to trim them ends, and they comb through, you got, you got a little, little, little breakage off. Them hairs are numbered. God ensures that as they comb through your hair, that those, those hairs that are coming off, he still has them numbered. He's so detailed. Detailed. Turn here. Go here. Don't say that. Say this. Move here. Step over a little bit to your left, a little bit to your right. And a lot of times we get annoyed by the details because the details are inconvenient. So we don't want them. With this, all I'm saying is you shouldn't walk and not have any detail. Because without detail, detail, you may be detoured by the devil. Because the devil loves to toss in detours, and we call them details because we, we can't discern what's God's voice and what's not God's voice. So we say, yeah, I feel like God told me to do this. You feel like he told you? And then you get there and it's like, oh, man, I messed up. Because you got to ensure that God is speaking and it's not the devil. The devil loves to mimic God. And just because, listen to me, and just because it's good detail, good information does not mean it's always from God. So you got to live informed. Amen? Because God informs you before he ever creates anything. Thanks. <laughs> he informed before anything is before anything is ever created. Somebody knows about it. And the issue and the concern for me is he's giving you. We don't understand that he's giving us this information so that we can partner with what he creates. So when he speaks a word, we have to partner with the word to see it manifest in the earth. But he informs it because he wants to invade it. But you have to be okay with the information. Every major move of God in the Bible first began with prophecy. What's prophecy? Information, revelation, insight, instruction. These things, every instruction God gives you is very prophetic. So when he wants to do something in you, he starts talking to you. So if he starts, he's been talking to you recently, you should probably pay close attention because he's trying to do something in you that you have no idea about. And that's why you should never allow the enemy to convince you to run away from the voice of God. Because running, running away from the voice of God means you abandon information that's vital to your future. Say amen. amen. Good. Wake up, please. Y'all need a coffee shot in, the, in, your, in your left butt cheek? Like, wake up. Yeah, butt cheek, you know. Sometimes you get easy me to just stab there. They, they, put, they put a little stir shot right there. You need, you need a little, <laughs> wake up. <laughs> God is not stingy 
with details. We are just stingy with devotion. Because anytime you abandon time, you abandon information. If you go throughout your day not knowing what's next, it may be because you put off devotion. And when you lean into devotion, you get the details. But there was nobody in the Bible that ever received any details without first going to devotion. That's why David started out this thing saying, the Lord is my light. Because he needed some details and he had some intel because of first devotion. God is going to create something in you, through you, but it's going to first start with information. And the only way you get that information is if you get into devotion. If you want miracles in your life, I believe God's doing some phenomenal things in our lives. But in order to have a miracle, you need information. You need instruction. Because the stubborn can't have anything linked to the supernatural. Because why would God give re the rebellious information that they're going to run amok with in the first place. <laughs> if you don't like information, you don't like your future. Because your future is the order to, on the access point to your future is information. And the lack of information says, I don't care about where you're sending me. I only care about what right now. And a lot of us get so stuck in the waiting game like, Lord, why are you not talking to me? The thing is, though, he is talking. You're, he's just talking in your future. And you want to hear his voice now. He's saying, no, step into the next place. And that's where I am. I am very, I'm speaking very loudly, but you're listening very softly. If you listen in the wrong place, you will miss the instruction. Psalm 27 starts out saying, the Lord is in my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear or dread? The Lord is the strength of my life and whom shall I be afraid? Notice that David said, the Lord is my light. I'm skipping through now. The Lord is my light. He is my. Someone screamed the word my. my. David was not just a person with, that had some mental issues and some mental warfare. He was a person also that was a prophet. He is not mentioned and listed much as a prophet, but he was very much so a prophet, meaning he had a personal experiences with the Lord to say that he is something, which means that God is always unveiling himself, and you can't camp out at some previous revelation that makes you comfortable or you'll miss what he's trying to do new in your life. God is trying to raise up people that will listen to him keenly and if you listen to him you'll be lost into the next place but your future desires your ear and I'm praying in the name of Jesus that your ear would be attentive that you would hear him like you never have before because your future is predicated upon how well you hear and how well you understand the Lord is. He is sure about that thing, Pamela. He, he is. He's not maybe. He's not sometimes. He's not perhaps. He is my light. And I wish that there would be people in this room that would make your assurance known. The Lord is my light. He is my healer. He is my savior. He is my salvation. And I don't have a reason to doubt because I know that he is. The greatest warfare you will ever go through is when you doubt who he is. And that's when the enemy loves to speak something in the place. Notice the enemy, the enemy only tempts you and pokes you at the place where you're most unsure. He can't touch what you know for a fact because my history has already said it. But I'm telling you what I know. If you know for your for a fact, my mommy said, I know that I know that I know that I know. And when you know, there's no reason to tempt you because you know. But the devil's only talking to you. In the place you doubt him the most. If you have ever like, well, Lord, what do I need to work on? When's the last time the devil talked to you? And what did he talk to you about? That's what you need to work on. That's what you need to work on right there. When he reveals himself, you have to learn to embrace it. Someone screamed the phrase, embrace it. Because one of the worst things you can do is push off what God was trying to do new in your life. I don't want that. Not right now. We love saying that. Not right now. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe some of your, your greatest poison is procrastination. Tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. That, we used to sing a song all the time. Tomorrow, I give my life. Tomorrow, 
it's, it's it's so it's it's very cute. It's it's crazy, but it, it is it bred it bred procrastination in the body of Christ. I'm telling you, you got to examine. Listen to me. Even in this season of your life, you have to examine what you're singing. What's the song over your life for this season? Because if you don't have the right song, you may be singing yourself into a wrong season when God's trying to give you a new song. Every major moment in the Bible was accompanied, I taught you all this, by an altar. Anytime something new was there, it was accompanied by an altar. But the point of that, they learned something new about God that was very important, which means the altars are only built when new revelation comes. And so God is trying to give you some new revelation, but you won't build an altar. And the way it sticks is if you have an altar. What is an altar? It's a memorial, something I can always come back to and be reminded of. And the reason why you're being assassinated is because you won't build an altar. You think, oh, I can just keep it in my mind. I'm fine. I don't got to build nothing. No, you need an altar to stay there until he does something to you. Hmm. Psalm 23. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. A few chapters later, y'all, he then says, the Lord is my light and salvation. Follow me. Psalm 23, he has one name. Psalm 27, he has a different name. Only a few chapters later, Maurice, he gets a new name for God, which means God is not delaying his identity from you. He just wants you to realize what he's trying to show you. And I'm telling you, something is about to shift in the chapter of your life that's about to give you a new name for God. We've never heard him call that for you. But wait until God gets done with you. There's about to be a new name released over this church, over your life, in your ministry, in your business in your finances and it begins first with an altar so if I take the word light someone scream the word light it means deliverance the Lord is my deliverance and my salvation which means there is a relationship between the two, which means you cannot have darkness and call him the light at the same time. The only way you can call him my light, David said, the reason why I'm calling him my light is because he snatched me out of a horrible pit. That's the only reason why he was able to say that. And so what I'm telling you is you need to be delivered. And deliverance after deliverance happens, then you have a new name for him. And the new name comes after you've been free and decided he speaks about fear the importance of fear and the necessity of fear and why listen to me because every new level that you're going to get to requires a level of fear hmm, I know it's like what yeah, every new level you get to is going to require a new level of fear. Here's what I'm saying that fear for the Lord, not for the things in front of you. If you keep your eyes on him, you won't be afraid about what's in front of you. But the concern is a lot of us have gotten afraid at what's in front of us and not him who already went before us. <laughs> He's the strength of my life. Someone screamed the word strength. Which means if he said he is my strength, that means he had to go listen through a season where he was weak. Because the only way you're able to find out who he is is if you have to eventually get to a deficit first to find out what he is. Man, some of y'all get so messed up over what you don't have, but you're missing out on an introduction that's waiting for you. And because you try to fix it, you miss out on what he's trying to show you. He wants to give you what you're lacking, but instead of accepting the lack, you go and try to leverage your own self. When the wicked, even my enemies and my flows, came to eat of my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Before the Lord was his light, he was confronted by wickedness. So that's why he wrote, win the wicked, even my enemies. Because why? You need enemies. You're not doing nothing right if no one hates you. You know, we always say, my haters are my elevators, you know, <laughs> little stuff like that, you know. Yeah, whack. <laughs> but my point is, I want you, the rest of this year and the rest of your life, to stop apologizing for what God has done for you. 
Because you think saying sorry will stop them from being enemies. No, God placed you in a company of people who you thought were your friends or your family to only to say, oh my gosh, like, what well, you, makes you think you're so cool, you're so great, you're higher above. Now, I'm not any better than you, but my God is better than anybody I'm around right now. And I refuse to apologize about the elevation that's coming to my life as God grows me, matures me, elevates me, lifts me up. I'm not apologizing anymore. I'm not apologizing for who God made me to be. He made me fearfully and wonderfully crafted who I am and crafted who you are. Don't you dare apologize for being, for being who God called you to be. The Lord is my light, my salvation. When the end, my enemy, the wicked, came to eat in my flesh, the Lord is my light, number one. He's my salvation, number two. Num verse, uh, next part, number three. When my enemies and my foes came to eat of my flesh, which means the wicked are only triggered by light. Just walk, I'm just skipping through the verse, okay? He, 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 they are triggered by light. And the concern is you always want to dim down the light when you get around certain people. And you're not, you're not, you're, you think, oh, uh, oh yeah, you're my, you're a great friend. I'm telling you, if you allow the light to come in your life, it will expose people around you who really don't like who you are. And I'm not one of them people and preachers that be, you know, preaching like, oh, you know, you got all these enemies around you, you got all these haters around you. Let me tell you, if all, if you just learn how to be yourself, it will always show who's for God and who's not. We are not a people who bows to any other name except the name of Jesus for it's at the name of Jesus that demons will tremble it's at his name alone though y'all there's something you also need to understand the enemy attacks only those listen to me who are not in his grip <laughs> the enemy only attacks those who aren't in his grip so if you are being attacked, it shows you, Miss Ross, the enemy doesn't have you in his grip, ain't step. Is there anybody in this room that can be thankful? I know. That's okay. It was good that I was afflicted, David said. Because that means if I'm being attacked, that means you don't got me. So I can say, nah, 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 and you still ain't going to get me because God is my protection. God is also trying to do something in your perception. Pay attention. Because we like, oh, I want to perceive, I want to perceive. But perception is very important. Perception means you have the ability to assess and determine what's around you. But just because you see it, pay attention, doesn't mean you understand it. You can see this towel is black. But you don't understand how this towel got black. The concern for me is that we can call a spade a spade. We can call a fish a fish. We can call a demon a demon. But we don't comprehend why and what we are seeing. We can identify it, but we cannot give intel on it. And the concern for me with that is, is that if you don't understand the importance of looking inward to something, you're going to miss the true intent of why it's here because you're so fascinated about what you see. You don't need just perception. You need information and intel on it. My point is, there's things that Satan sees about you. He can see it, but he doesn't have any inside scoop. And just because the enemy magnifies what's around you doesn't mean that you have the ability to collide with his observation. I'll talk about that to my Sunday school class next week. He may see it. My point is he may, the enemy may see it, but he doesn't understand it. What has your pain turned you into? Maybe, let's say it this way. Who has your pain turned you into? What has your pain turned you into? Because we are a people that does not know how to process pain well. Because anytime there's pain, we want to get away from it. 
Mm -hmm. But no one's just standing there saying, ow, ow, ow. You're not doing that. You're trying to get away because you don't want to be there. But I'm telling you, the maturity level that God's trying to call you to is you can say, Bring it on. I'm ready. Ow. That's right. Hit me again. Ow. But I'm still going to stand here because I don't want to escape what God's trying to give me insight on. If you're under attack right now, even from the enemy, standpoint of the enemy, the question you got to ask yourself is, what's the last thing God said to you? And if the last thing that God said to you is where the enemy's always going to come and attack you. Though a host encamps all around me, my heart shall not fear. Notice he did not say, I shall not fear. My heart shall not fear. Because the heart is the central place of all of your emotion. If So my heart is not going to fear. Because mm-hmm. my heart is going to influence my mind. And what my mind is going to influence all that. So my heart will not fear. Though war goes all around me, I will be confident. Now how in the world can you be confident with calamity? This means it is not some sneak attack, y'all. It is a fortress that was set coming to sabotage what, where David was. But the thing is, though, the reason why he said all this is because Miss Ross, he realized he had an intercessor. Praying for him, interceding for him, and warring for him. So there's no reason to be afraid because I know who's praying for me. I need you to understand that sometimes I'm telling you, we get so caught up in all these things going on around us. But don't you know that God is praying for you constantly? Or is anybody else thankful that he is praying for you? That he doesn't lack language and for, his, for the prayer toward me. He knows what to pray, how to pray, where to pray, when to pray. He knows all that because he is God. One thing have I desired, asked of the Lord, that will I seek, inquire, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever, all of my days, to behold his beauty. I love that. To gaze upon the beauty, the sweet attractiveness and delight loveliness of the Lord. So wait, I got a question. The verse before that he was in war. Now he's talking about one thing have I desired. (laughs) Jacoby, he was just in war. Bang, bang, pow, pow. (laughs) And out of war, you say one thing I desire? How many of us would do that? (laughs) We got a huge, we got a huge limp. (laughs) You're going to be mad about that leg more than anything. You got a band-aid or something, God? Like, cause we'll put all the, we put all the attention on the pain. And that's how we get moved out of promise because our, our attention, our gaze got taken off. I'd rather drag my leg, but if David said, one thing have I desired, woo! and that will I seek after. If I got to crawl there because I'm wounded, one thing have I seek. I don't, care what, I don't care what pain I'm in. All I know is I got to get there to where he's at. One thing have I desired. The concern for me is we don't know what to do with our desires. Which is why a lot of us fall in a lot of different things. You'll know when you desire something because it will be the drive of who you are. Desire will become the vehicle, the driver of the vehicle because it's there. It is right there. Whether it's a good desire or a bad. Have you ever desired a nice piece of cake? A, a a A nice meal that somebody cooks for you? Have you ever desired a piece of candy, you know, and you like, mm, it just sounds so good right now. And what you do, got your keys, went to the store, the closest one, because we want to go too far. It's inconvenient, you know, Jack. Let's go up the speedway real quick. And we get it, get back to the house, or some of us don't even wait till we get back to the house. We're going to start munching on it. <laughs> But it became the drive because you wanted it. You see what I'm saying to you? It will become your drive. And even old things can still drive you. Oh, y'all want me to turn my plan? Bad or 
good. Listen, because desire, listen, look at the scripture. One thing have I desired and that will I seek. Desire came first and seek came second. Why? Because desire will fuel your seek. And if you desire the right thing, you'll seek the right thing. If you desire the wrong thing, you will seek the wrong thing. David said, I desire you. So I'm going to seek you. That was David's resolve. He's, I'm never going to quit. I'm never going to leave because you are my one desire. And can I prophesy this to you? That you are on the verge of prophetic manifestation. But if you quit too soon because of what the enemy is throwing at you, you will end up missing what God is trying to do. You're on the very verge of it. But you better make sure your desires are in the right place. You've got to make sure that your desires are right so your seat can be purified and your seat can be fortified I believe that God is trying to find out where are my seekers in the room where are the people that's willing to open up your heart and open up your mind and seek him like never before but if our desires are on the wrong thing so will our seek be on the wrong thing and if there is a small creep or crack in your desire, the enemy will influence that and he will come in and do what he wants to do with you. You'll have three good weeks of prayer and time with God. And then that fourth week, he will come in like a flood and knock you out because you did not make sure every crack was sealed. The greatest thing you can do in desire is investigate your space. You better make sure your desire is all passed up. I don't want that no more. I don't want them no more. I don't want to go there no more. My desire is only him. And if we become a church, it is only after him we will see great manifestation in this place. But my concern is that a lot of us are so involved in everything else that we're missing out on the one thing. <laughs> one thing. Then he said to inquire, which means to ask questions. <laughs> so I'm desiring you, seeking you, to ask you some questions? That's why you want to be there, David? Ain't that cool? Why was he asking for answers? Because David's prophetic. So he needs answers because in order for you to properly see correctly, you need answers. Without answers, your vision will be foggy. I want to be with you so I can ask some questions. Sometimes we lose the war because we lack word. Lack of information. Here's where it gets fishy. Ready? And I'll, and I'll hang up my hat. Don't close your book yet, though. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with, the, with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, mm -hmm. and that life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. So every time God wants to do something new in you, he's going to talk about light. Pay attention. The first thing God was, light, in the beginning. Pay attention. There was light. In every area of your life, when you accept him, the lights come on. But light, pay attention, also means in Psalm 27 and in John chapter 1, clarity. So when David said, the Lord is my light, he was saying, the Lord is my clarity. Two of y'all got it. 
Why was this important? Because the reason I'm saying this is that the reason why I'm putting this on to you is because the light is the word of God, not your Bible. So what was David saying in Psalm 27? The Lord is my clarity because I remembered the word that you gave me and then everything for me lit up. He, he simply reflected on what God said, y'all. That's what made him confident. I wish that, I wish y'all, I was, I'm like this inside. I wish y'all were too. This, this is the understanding. That if you fail to remember, you will fail. But the more you remember what he said over your life, everything will be clear for you. And you can say, the Lord is my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? You are only afraid where you lack remembrance. <laughs> for in the day of trouble, he shall hide me. I, I love it. And then go, go on through because everything else is good too. But like at the, at the end of the chapter, he said, although my father and my mother forsake me, yet the Lord will take me up, adopt me as his child. I love that because I saw something I never, why would he bring up something about abandonment in the midst of talking about how the Lord is good? Why would he do that? Because what he apparently, what he reflected on made him cope with his rejection. I know y'all don't want me to quit, but I can. I'm telling you, what you re will reflect on will make you cope with some things. But don't you dare allow what the enemy has thrown at you to make you cope. That you stay there longer than you should. Have your moment, but don't you turn it into a monument. When I have been rejected or abandoned, the Lord took me up. Some of y'all, hey, some of you all about to experience the take up. That's, I'm, that's, the, that's the word for you. Some of you all have been trying to figure out what's next. God said the word of the Lord to you today is I'm about to take you up. You're about to be lifted up higher than you ever had before. But it starts with you realizing I got an issue and that issue can become ours if you allow me to take you up. Because prophecy has a way of touching your history. We don't like it. If I get up, Chris get up, Mama Sharon get up, and we say something, and it pokes at that history, you don't, I got to deal with that. I got to go through that again. I got to, I got to, I, uh, you don't want to deal with it because you want to keep hearing it. But let me tell you, you need to be comfortable with what was in your history. It's history for a reason. Why are you being triggered by your history? Why are you being triggered? It's history. It's not present anymore. It's in the past. And if you're being triggered, maybe you still are present with it. But it's my history. Y'all, can I just shout us all? I'm, and me included. Can I shout us all? Your history became history when he got out from that grave. That's where you need to thank God. And I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus. Because it had not been for the blood, my history would still be with me right now. What you're not willing to share that's in your history is killing you. Because privacy, privacy will kill your prophecy. Privacy will kill your prophecy. What you're not willing to expose is crippling not only you, but the souls. That's why you got to get out of the hell you're in right now. I refuse to stay bound because somebody else needs the key in my mouth called my testimony. And I can't keep involving myself with my fleshly desires because I only have one thing I'm seeking after. So because people are afraid to be to tell on themselves 
we have been coaching for over 2,000 years a church of people that fake the funk. We have been breeding clowns and don't even know it. We have classes and series of breeding clowns. Clowns, clowns, clowns. Church is nothing but a circus arena because we are not allowing people to be honest with themselves. You need to learn how to be honest and be okay. Yes, I did it. Yes, I still want to do it. And I need help out of it. You need to be honest with yourself. Because I'm telling you, if you be honest, that's where the help is. The help is where you are honest. I'd rather be honest and say it. I want to drink it. I want to taste it. I want to touch it. I want to go there. I want to go back. I want to retreat. I want to leave everything. But God, here I am. The one thing I desire. point of all I really wanted to get you truth at the end he said had I not believed that I would see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living wait and hope for the Lord be brave and be of good courage and let your heart be stout and enduring yes wait for hope for and expect the Lord I got something, and then we're gonna we can shout about it, and then we're gonna go home. I looked this up, Sharo, and the word wait. Ready? Lean in. The word wait in the Greek, literally, you ready for this, Maurice? Is all man. All man. A W. All man. That's, that's the word of the Lord to you. If you would just learn to wait on the Lord and be, you're right there. Oh man, you put, you did your big one right there, God. Oh man, our eyes have not. Oh man, I've been waiting all this time, and all I'm about to hear is a oh. Ain't that cool? You about to get an all man over your life. I'm telling you, just go ahead and start practicing it right now. You don't see it, but oh man, God, that was good right there. Man, you fixed them up real good. Oh, leave it. Look at me in the mirror. I don't look like what I've been through. Don't sound like what I've been through. I'm not, oh man. You have been disappointed for a long time saying all oh, man in defeat but I'm telling you that that defeated all oh, man is about to turn into a victorious all oh, man all oh, man is about to be all oh, man God just wait on the Lord David said though ain't still and be of good courage so that when the time is right oh you think that God yeah why would you think that God would allow you to go through moments where it seems as those things have been disappointing for you without giving you a wow factor so when he said and I'm done there shall be a performance that's what he meant. Mama Sharon last week preached so beautifully. But at the, she shared a story in her, in her sermon about how she was praying about the person she knows. And it got down to the last little wire. And she got an all man factor. Because you don't really get pulled in to say that until it is the last minute. But I'm telling you, listen, God is not about time. He is about timing, but he is not about time. I'm telling you what I know. And if you get so wrapped up like, oh, Lord, you're too late, you'll be like them people that when Lazarus died, Master, if you would have been here four days earlier, you could have stopped this. It doesn't matter what could have been stopped. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm everything in between. I control all of this. Why are you mad? Because something seems to be done. But it's not done because I still got something to say about it.
And I'm telling you that what you're looking at that's dead right now, God has something more to say about it. That's the word to you. God has more to say about what you think can happen. He has more to say about what you think he cannot finish. He has more to say about what you think is going to be done and belong to some. God is not done talking. And when he's done talking, that's when it's over. But until he gets done talking, I'm going to keep on worshiping and thanking him and praising him and lavishing my love upon him. Because why would he leave me all this way? To allow me to go down as a, somebody who was defeated. So I will be confident. Yes. So we sing that song. I will remain confident in this. I will see the goodness of the Lord. That's where this comes from. Psalm 27. But you can't sing that and say that and pronounce that. If you're unwilling to wait properly. So I'm going to wait. I'm going to have my song. My little bottle of water. And I'm going to wait. Why? Because you need to learn how to get ready and prepare for what God is doing in you. Why? Because there is an all man factor that's coming to your life. You've experienced disappointment for, all, for a lot. You know what disappointment feels like. You know. Some of y'all are trapped in that feeling. You'll believe for them but won't believe for you, you know. No, it's okay, all right? You got faith real good for everybody. <sighs> Amen. So I'm done. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> I'm going to just throw this podium in the back. So we got, I'm real scared. The, the, so let's, let's wait well. We didn't, we all this preaching, teaching without waiting. It's not just for, okay, well, cool, I'm just going to wait. And listen. Don't wait the same way anymore. Don't wait the same. You've been waiting the same all, for all this time. At Lord, teach me how to wait. Is an introduction to saying, Lord, teach me a new system of how to wait. Because every season requires a different theology of waiting. <laughs> Woo! All right. You've got to realize the importance of it, y'all. Every season requires a different system of waiting, a different method of waiting. You can't wait the same you did in the last season. Why? The promise is not the same in the last season. New promise, new way to wait. 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 There was a, um, you know, I, I cut hair. And so there's a new little, uh, little air gun thing that I like, that I saw. It looked real good. They, they had it. It blows the hair off of you. Can blow, you know. It can clean inside like their clippers, so you don't have to like take it off and like get in between it with a little thing. I mean, it does it all for you. It's real good. So I was so excited about it. Right? Good, beautiful. Here's the thing. Pay attention. But here's the thing. So when it come, when it came to this, I was like, okay, cool. I'm gonna order it. So I'm ordering it. It's been one week, two week, three weeks. I ain't heard nothing. So I'm like, did I get scammed? This is not. This is not cheap. I even did pay in four because it wasn't cheap. And I don't want to see that money leave my account, you know, paying four easy payments. And all those easy payments are done. But I don't have a device. So I emailed them. I said, what, what's going on? Where's my order? They said, well, we're so sorry. The demand was higher than we initially thought it would be. And we are so understaffed that we're just trying our best. But we promise you it is on the way. Just give us a few more weeks and we will get it out to you. And I was like, all right, cool. So in my head, I'm like, they said, if you want to cancel it, you can cancel. I'm like, oh, I'm going to cancel it because I've been waiting all this time. And the Lord said to me, but it's already been paid for, so why keep waiting? And the word to you is the promise over your life has already been paid for. Don't you dare give up because it's already been paid for. And let me tell you, this season is not giving you back any refunds. All that prayer, all them tears, all that turmoil, all those dreams, everything you invested into this time, there is no refund. So you might as well wait until it happens and manifest in your life. There's no refunds. Just wait on it. Wait, wait, wait. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. Wait on the Lord and continue to be happy and joyful. Because apparently in my waiting is producing a level of joy I don't have yet. You think the joy happens when you get the promise. No, if you get joy in the waiting, you have enough joy for the promise. 
if you only get happy when it shows up, you didn't miss the point of waiting. All right. Let me do like the old school church. The doors of the church are now open. You know? It's already been paid for. <laughs> they bring them old wooden chairs out. The lady come over to you with a little notebook. You want to join the church by invitation, by letter, by water baptism. By... Hey, fam. You've got to... It's already been paid for. And your refusal to wait is an embarrassment of the cross. Your refusal to wait is an embarrassment of the cross of Jesus. He died so you had a right to the promise. So let's wait well. Father, I thank you for this. I bless this word. We are encouraged today. And we're going to wait on you. And we're going to do it well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Will you clap your hands and bless God?